Let's talk about dominion over sin. The fundamental problem of the human race is sin. From the very beginning when Adam and Eve fell, the whole human race has fallen under sin. The bad news for all of us, as Romans 3.23 says, that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And then Romans 6.23 says, the wages of sin is death. The problem is God is holy. He wants to have fellowship with us, but He cannot have fellowship with sin. And because we are sinners, all of us have sinned, we have broken that fellowship with God. We've broken that relationship. And of course, if we live the rest of our lives separated from God, then when we die, we will still be separated from God. That eternal separation from God is called the lake of fire, an eternity without God's presence. Sin has destructive consequences in this life and in the life to come. It hurts us physically, emotionally, spiritually. It hurts our families. It hurts our society. And it ends up in a devastating eternity. That's the problem we all face. That's the bad news. And there's no one who can get us out of this. Um, there's no, we can't save ourselves because we've sinned. No one else can save us because they've all sinned too. But the good news is that God has provided a plan of salvation through Jesus Christ. The word gospel literally means the good news. And the good news, if you read 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1 through 4, you'll find the good news is that Jesus Christ died for our sins. He was buried in the tomb and he rose again the third day. Now, Jesus Christ is the Son of God. That means he's a real human being who was born of a virgin by a miracle of God's Spirit. Jesus is actually God manifested in the flesh, God coming into this world to redeem us. As I said, uh, no one else could redeem us because all had sinned. But Jesus Christ was the only sinless human being who ever lived. Therefore, he could represent us to God and he could lay down his life for us. The wages of sin is death. Someone had to die in our place. The only one who could do that was the Lord Jesus Christ. As a human, he was able to lay down his life for us. He was able to pay the penalty for our sins. Hebrews 9.22 says, without the shedding of blood, there is no remission. There is no way to take away sins without paying the price. So Jesus Christ paid the price. As a God was a spirit. God can't die. But in the flesh, Jesus was able to die for us. Because he was a true human, he could shed his blood. He could die. He could take our place as our kinsman redeemer. He could pay the penalty for our sins. But because he was God manifest in the flesh, the infinite God who took on the penalty, then the death of that one man could cover the sins of the whole human race, all human beings for all eternity. So only as someone who's both God and man could Jesus be our savior. As a human, he died. As God, he had authority to take away our sins. And so salvation is found in the Lord Jesus Christ. As I said a moment ago, the good news that compensates or overcomes the bad news, the dominion over sin, is the gospel, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Now, I've already explained the death is essential because it takes away our sins. The burial is likewise essential because it proved that death was real, not fake. And it proved that what happened next, the resurrection, was a miracle because the tomb was sealed, Roman guards were put in place, and yet on resurrection morning, the tomb was found empty because Jesus Christ arose from the dead. The resurrection of Jesus is also essential because if Jesus had merely died, he would be no different than Buddha or Muhammad or Socrates, a good man perhaps, but who died and his story is over. But because Jesus Christ rose from the dead, then he turned death into life. He turned defeat into victory. He showed that God had accepted the payment of, for our sins. God had accepted the sacrifice. Jesus Christ arose and now he reigns forever 
in His glorified human body as one of us, yet He remains God manifested in the flesh. So the resurrection of Jesus Christ completes that message and Jesus Christ can become our Savior. The work is done. That happened 2,000 years ago. Jesus died for the whole human race, but the whole human race is not automatically saved. So how can we be saved today? We must personally apply the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ to our lives today in order for us to personally have the forgiveness of sins and to have the dominion over sin and to enjoy abundant life. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 8 through verse 9 explains that salvation is by grace through faith. It's the gift of God. It's not of works, lest anyone should boast. Grace simply means salvation is God's gift to us. We can't pay for it. We can't earn it. We can't deserve it. We can't uh, live such a holy life that God has to save us. We're all bound by sin without God's grace. Grace simply means that salvation is God's gift to us and it's God's work in us because God begins to change us from the inside out. Not only does he forgive our sins, but he gives us power to overcome sin so that we can live a holy life every day. If we do stumble and fall, we can get back up. If we do sin, we can confess it. We can ask God to forgive us. We get back up with the determination to live a holy life for the rest of that day. And we can do so by the power of God's spirit. So how does that really happen? By grace, we're saved through faith. Faith is our positive response to God's grace. Faith means we accept God's message and we apply God's message to our lives. It's important to understand that both aspects are essential. You know, in English, it's possible to say, I believe something and not really have much of a commitment to it. We can walk outside, for example, and say, I believe it's going to rain. Well, that's just an opinion, just a possibility. But faith in the Bible is more than simply mental acceptance. It also involves a commitment to what you believe. So not only do we accept the gospel as God's plan of salvation, but we must apply the gospel personally to our lives through obedience. In other words, faith involves obedience. It's trust, it's reliance, it's commitment. In Romans chapter 1, verse 16 through 17, the Apostle Paul wrote under the inspiration of, of the Holy Spirit that the gospel of Jesus Christ is the power of God to salvation to everyone who believes. Notice that's present tense. That means continues to believe. And then he explained that we will go from faith to faith as it is written. And there he quotes from Habakkuk 2.4 in the Old Testament, as it is written, the just or the righteous shall live by faith. Notice faith is not just one point in time. We go from faith to faith. The just shall live by faith. It's a relationship. It's a new way of life, of trust, reliance, commitment, obedience. I'll give you an example. The story is told that years ago at Niagara Falls, there used to be tightrope walkers who would perform before thousands of people. And it's said that there was a tightrope walker who one day, of course, he would ask the crowds, do you believe I can do it? You know, I'll, I'll show you, but you got to believe it. And so they would cheer him on and he would walk across the top of the falls. Of course, if he were to slip, he would no doubt be drowned or crushed beneath the waterfall. So one day he took a wheelbarrow and he said, do you think I can push this in front of me on the tightrope across the top of the falls. And of course, everybody cheered. Yes, we want to see you do it. Finally, he picked one vocal supporter, said, okay, get in the wheelbarrow. I'll push you across. It'll be a great experience. Well, nobody would go. Obviously, they didn't want to risk their lives. No matter how much they believed he could do it, they did not want to take the chance. That illustrates the difference between just a mental faith, yeah, I think you can do this, or a verbal faith, sure, you can do that. The difference between that and trusting your life to what you believe. 
So when the Bible says, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved, does it mean just stand on the sidelines with your arms folded saying, sure, Jesus, I think you can do it. Yeah, I believe in you. I believe you're the Savior, the Son of God. Sure. No, it means more than that. It means committing your life to his hands. In other words, you cannot separate faith from obedience. In fact, Romans 1, 5 speaks of the obedience of faith. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 8 says, God will bring judgment. When Jesus Christ comes back to earth, he will bring judgment on all those who do not know God and who do not obey the gospel of Jesus Christ. Romans 6, 17 says, but God be thanked that you were, past tense, the servants of sin, but you obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered to you. So Romans 1 says we're saved if we believe the gospel. Romans 6 says we're saved if we obey the doctrine. Are these two different ways of being saved? No, of course not. It's the same book, same author, same Holy Spirit that inspired it. It's saying the same thing in different words. If you truly believe the gospel of Jesus Christ, you will be saved. But if you truly believe in a scriptural sense, if you have saving faith, you will not only accept this message mentally, you will not only confess this message verbally, but you will obey this message. And thus you will obey the doctrine. In other words, in a scriptural sense, there is no such thing as a disobedient believer. Uh, if you truly believe, you will act. In other words, you cannot separate faith from obedience. They're two sides of the same coin. As a German theologian once said, only he who believes is obedient. And only he who is obedient believes. The test of whether you truly have faith is whether you obey. I'll give you another example. Let's say I begin yelling, the building is on fire, run, flee, run for your lives. If you really believe that message, what are you going to do? You're just going to sit there saying, oh, that's great information. I believe you. Of course not. If you really believe that, you're going to run out of the building. You're going to obey. If you run out of the building and you're saved, somebody interviews you, you could say, somebody said, well, how are you saved from the fire? How did you get out? What happened? You could say, Brother Bernard saved me. Or Brother Bernard's word saved me. Or I believe what Brother Bernard said, and so that's why I'm saved. Or I obeyed what he said, and that's why I'm saved. Likewise, we say God saves us. We're saved by grace. It's God's gift. We're saved by the word of God. We're saved by believing the gospel. We're saved by obeying the gospel. Those are all different ways of saying the same thing. If you truly believe the gospel, you will obey it. Now let's put this all together. If the gospel is the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus, and that happened 2,000 years ago, how do we apply that gospel today? If we're going to believe it's really true, as I've just showed you, we've got to obey it. Well, how do we do that? How do we obey the gospel? How do we apply it personally to our lives? The answer is found in Acts chapter 2 on the birthday of the Christian church. If you study that chapter, you'll find the apostle Peter preached with the support of all the other apostles. And the essence of his message was that Jesus died for our sins. He was buried. He rose again. Now he's the Lord and Savior. He is the Messiah. It's very interesting because here you have the first message of the Christian church. You have all 12 apostles at the same place at the same time preaching the same message. The crowd cries out, what must we do? They were asking how to be saved, how to be forgiven of their sin of crucifying Jesus, how to accept Jesus as the Messiah, the Lord, and the Savior. This is a unique in, in the whole Bible because here's the only place where you have all 12 apostles at the same place at the same time giving the answer to the question, how to be saved. In Acts chapter 2, verse 38, Peter gives the answer. Repent, turn away from your sins. That's a death to the old life. That's being crucified with Christ. Be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. Now here in Romans 6, we find that being baptized is a burial with Christ. So when we're baptized with the name of Jesus Christ invoked over us, 
we're actually being buried with Christ. So just as when someone dies, we place them under the ground. So when someone repents of their sins, they turn away from the old life. They kill the flesh, so to speak. They're crucified with Christ. Well, the next step is we baptize them. And notice it's by immersion, just like a burial should be. And it's specifically with the invocation of the name of Jesus. Because the Spirit of God did not die for us. God is our Father in heaven in relationship. But God as Father cannot die. But Jesus Christ, the Son of God, a real human being, who was God manifest in the flesh. He could lay down his human life. Only Jesus died for us. Only Jesus was buried for us. And that's why we're always specifically baptized in the name of Jesus Christ, just like all the accounts of the early church in the book of Acts. So we're buried with him in baptism. And then the apostle Peter concluded in Acts 2.38 with a promise it's both a promise and a command. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost or the Holy Spirit is God's Spirit come to dwell in our lives. And just as in Acts chapter 2, the onlookers that day had just watched the 120 believers receive the Holy Spirit with the initial sign of speaking in tongues as the Spirit gave utterance. In other words, they spoke miraculously in languages they had never learned as they praised God. That was a sign that the Spirit of God had come inside of them, was dwelling them, was guiding their minds, and taking control of the most difficult member of the body, according to the book of James, which is the tongue. And so that was the initial sign that the Holy Spirit had come to dwell. Of course, the abiding sign is the fruit of the Spirit, the pursuit of holiness, the Christian life. But the initial sign is this miraculous evidence. And of course, the Spirit of Christ is the Spirit that raised up the body of Jesus from the dead. The same Spirit that will one day raise us from the dead. So when we receive the Holy Spirit, we participate in the resurrection life of Jesus Christ. That's not only in the life to come, but here and now. When we receive the Holy Ghost, we receive power over sin, power to resist the devil, power to live a holy life. So how do we obey the gospel? Repentance, water baptism in Jesus' name, receiving the gift of the Holy Ghost with the initial sign of speaking in tongues. This experience is our conversion, our initiation into the church of the New Testament. It's our new birth. We become a new person. We're born again as children of God. It's not an ending. It's a beginning. It's a new way of life. From that point on, we're forgiven of our sins. We have the name of Jesus in our life. We've made a commitment to live a new life because of our repentance. And we have the power to live a new life through the Holy Spirit. Now we can truly have dominion over sin. The devil can't make us do anything. Sin, even though we still have temptations, we still have a sinful nature until the Lord comes for his church and glorifies us, but we're no longer bound to that sinful nature. We no longer have to obey the dictates of the sinful nature. We can resist the devil, we can say no to temptation, and we can live a holy life. One day at a time, we can say today, I'm going to live for God. And through the power of the Holy Spirit, we can live for God. We can enjoy a life of holiness, a life of blessedness. We can have dominion over sin in our lives through the gospel of Jesus Christ and the power of the Holy Spirit. 